Okay, so what are binaries? What are binary formats? Um, this is a word that you might have heard sort of before um, when we're talking about cybersecurity, you know, people say finding the binaries for the device or looking at the binaries. Um, what is that? So this is a really vague term because, right, in the computer world, everything is binary, right? Your everything's a one and zero on the disk. It's a binary file. Um, when we say binary, though, uh, what they normally mean is this is some low-level code, right? It might be directly executable. So when you run a file on your computer, right, if it's Windows, you have like a .dot an exe file. Um, Right, so an exe file is an example of an executable. Um, if you're programming files into your, um, like Arduino, you're actually programming executables into that. Um, so if it's executable, we can directly execute it. Uh, but a binary doesn't necessarily mean it is directly executable. Um, normally, there could, there could be some other stuff around it. It could be encrypted, there could be a header or things like that. Um, but a binary file is typically one that is some low-level code. Um, it's normally possible to translate, right? So often these files are interesting because they can be executed in some format. Um, it might need, you know, it, typically the machine can directly use it, right? So it's directly in a format the machine can use um, in that it could be decompressed into then a file that it can run or something like that or de-encrypted. Um, so it's not limited just to directly executable files. That's sort of the, the important thing here. Um, but it's normally not in a really high level language. So we wouldn't call like a HTML file a binary, right? We wouldn't call a C file a binary. Um, yes, they're stored on disks as binary at the low level. Um, but when we say a binary, this is normally meaning some sort of file that is not human, like readable or understandable really. Um, and can be converted or used by the computer with sort of a, a low level of effort. Um, so in the embedded space, right, so on Windows I mentioned like exe is an example. This is an executable file, it's also a binary. Um, what you might run on into in embedded is different, so we typically won't have .exe files. A lot of embedded systems are not running Windows. Um, we might have files like this, so .bin, is the most obvious, right? It says, ah, this directly means binary. Um, but that's not the only ones. Um, there is no definition really for what a dot bin is. It just means this is a binary data that is somehow used by the target system. Um, the other ones have slightly better defined usability. So this is a big like question mark. Normally this is like a memory dump um, or something, right? So it's just raw data. Um, it could be an update file, so we'll look at that in the next lecture. Um, it could be kind of anything. Um, the other examples here are also typically low-level machine code, um, but they have some more format around them that makes them more understandable. So some of these actually encode the data into text, right? So uh, we'll look at like Intel Hex and S19. You can open in a, a text editor and you can look at it. It's still machine code, it's just been encoded in a way that a human can look at the machine code. Um, it's trivial to translate between them, so when people say binary, they're, you know, the fact that you can open it in a text editor, um, it's still impossible or difficult to really just look at and understand directly, uh, so we still would call it a binary. Um, all of these different file formats will have different features, uh, typically, they'll break down into this sort of category. Um, so normally the, the question is executable data. So all of them have the ability to include data that a computer or, or embedded system can execute, right? That's the whole point of any of these uh, binary file formats. Um, we may also have some address information, right? So we need to know if we look at our computer system, where in memory is the data supposed to be loaded or stored? Um, at the very low level of raw binary files, so this is where I say the .bin is not well defined, um, it may just be raw data and the, the computer needs to understand what's expected of it and where to load that, right? So that's something that it's not encoded in the file. Um, other file formats like hex and elf can actually encode um, at least the address information in the file. 
Uh, we can go further than that. So um, we also have a lot of stuff that's useful for debug. Um, so we have what we call section names. So rather than just an address, we might have something like a boot sections for the bootloader. Uh, you know, we could have a, a section that's actually used for data storage, a section that's used for a signature, all sorts of stuff. So these start to have more human readable names, um, which is useful for debug. And we can take that to the extreme with something called debugging symbols. Um, so some file formats let you actually embed debug information, right? Because the low level code, the computer doesn't care what you called your function that you gave your variables a nice name. That's purely for you as the human. Um, the computer just uses memory addresses, right? That's all it cares about. Um, so the debug symbol includes information like what memory address is what, um, uh, what memory address is what high level variable and things like that. Um, so if you take, let's, so let's look at a few, right? So I'm gonna take a look only at, um, we're gonna look at a dot bin example, dot hex example, and an elf. These are some of the, the most common ones. Um, so yeah, so elf, by the way, so when you look at these file formats, elf used to be called extensible linking format. Um, if, if you take any classes, you know, if you have it, really any classes, a lot of people know it by that name. Uh, the, the official definition got changed at some point to executable and linkable format. Uh, so you'll see both used. It's the same thing though. It's the exact same thing. Um, so if we take it, the first one, a .bin file. So this is a, a, a memory from a embedded system I was looking at. Um, if you try to open it in like notepad, it's just gonna look like this. So it's garbage because it's purely binary data, right? It's not data that can be understood by notepad. In fact, if you open a bin file in notepad or word or something like that and try to save it again, it normally is gonna totally corrupt it because um, notepad is gonna try to translate this to ASCII and it's not gonna work very well. Um, what you have to use is a uh, some sort of tool, so like, uh, a hex editor, it will often be called. In this case, I'm gonna use, uh, I'm using something called JFlash here, which is actually a tool for a programmer, but you can open files in it too, and it's free. Um, you'll notice with a binary file, it just assigned the address zero. So it's gonna ask you when you open it, what is this address, this file starting at? Because it has no idea. Um, so this file actually isn't supposed to be loaded into address zero, but there's no way to know. Um, the data itself then is just, this is just showing some hex data. So there's nothing too interesting about it. Um, this is just what's inside the file. We view it as hex. Um, yeah, so it's only raw data. There's not normally any other data. If there is, it's not a standard format. Um, if we compare that to Intel hex, uh, if I open the, the same, so this is actually the same representation of that binary data in Intel hex. Um, You'll notice that it's in Notepad. It actually opens and looks half sensible. We can see binary data. So if you look at this binary data, like 2800081, if we go back, right, we can see this 20081, stuff like that. So you can see the data is there. Um, it's just, so there's 13, right, 28, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the hex data is there. It's, it's now been encoded into um, like a human readable format, but it's still the raw kind of binary data. Um, it's hard to see the format this way because there's also address information. So the nice thing about hex is that it has some addressing information here. So if we open this file in something that understands Intel hex, you'll see that it's actually assigned, says no, this, this starts at some address, right? So some, whatever this address was in memory, um, how many zeros are there? Um, and then here's the data, right? So we need some way to, to actually view an Intel hex file that understands the format. Um, so it's not super efficient on size because it translated that bin file to uh, text, uh, but on the plus side, it includes address information, um, but it doesn't include debug. So the file format itself doesn't really have a way to include debug information. Um, so the final version is going to be the ELF file. This can include a whole bunch of stuff. Um, again, if we try to open it in Notepad, it looks like garbage now. So you can see it's sort of a binary file format um, in that it's not just, so with this, we sort of had this inefficiency because it was encoding everything to text. Um, ELF is more efficient 
The cool thing about ELF is that it has the possibility to include additional data. So um, what I have here is I've opened that same ELF file in a debugger. Um, and what you can see is these function names here are actually encoded in it. There's like, uh, so it's saying, hey, here, it even has like what the source files were that were used to compile this. So you could go find the source file um, and it can associate, you know, sections of code with the source file and stuff. So, so we have these debug symbols that include what the function names are, what variable names are, all sorts of useful stuff. Um, it doesn't have to include that though. That's an option that's enabled. So uh, a L file that has the debug symbols in it um, is very useful for a debug, uh, debugger, extremely useful for reverse engineering, but most of the time people would not purposely release that. It does happen, um, but normally you, you wouldn't include the debug information in the file. Um, it can include all sorts of stuff, files within it, multiple sections. Um, so it's a very, very, very flexible uh, file format. Um, it's very commonly used in like embedded Linux systems, right? So it would be less common in a super low level uh, system that's just like, you know, an ABR or an ARM device like you might have used in some of the classes. Um, but if you're using like a Linux system on a chip, this would be very common to use because this file format's actually used directly or can be used directly by a lot of Linux um, applications and systems. So yeah, so they, they may or may not be executable to summarize. Um, it could be an update, it could be encrypted, it could be compressed. Um, there's a lot of formats out there. There's sort of, you know, not, I don't wanna say an infinite number, um, but there's a, a variety of file formats that can be used here. Um, the most common you're gonna run into, so it's either like a .bin is a raw, normally this is raw data dumped from a device. If you're lucky, this is a sensible memory dump. If you're unlucky, it's something like just a raw dump of a disk, right? And the disk has its own formatting and stuff that you have to deal with. Um, the other one you'll run into is ELF. So if you're looking at like an embedded Linux or some sort of embedded system like that, um, it, it's very common to run into that. And there's other similar sort of uh, file formats like ELF that have all that debug information uh, that if you're not on a Linux system, if you're on some other architecture, you might run into too. But um, understanding, you know, that you either have typically a, a very raw file or a relatively raw file, but with some additional uh, address and context around it is the, the most useful part of this to understand. Um, because if you can get the second one, it's, it's very helpful in a lot of situations. Uh, but most of the time you're going to end up with just the raw binary file.